listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. This is hosted by the NOAA National Marine Protected Area Center. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I am standing in today for Lauren Winzel. Um, I personally am, am coordinator of the EBM Tools Network and uh, affiliated with OpenChannels.org, uh, who are co-hosts for the webinar. And we also have Nick Weiner from OpenChannels.org along, along as a co-moderator. Um, well, thank you again for being here today. Uh, we're going to be learning about the new HAEA National Estuarine Research Reserve um, from Matt Chassie of NOAA and Robert Tunin of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about those guys, um, um, Matt Chassie is a coastal management specialist with NOAA's Office of Coastal Management. Uh, he has supported the National Estuarine Research Reserve System since 2004 and works collaboratively with a variety of federal, state, and local stakeholders in support of the five Gulf of Mexico reserves. Uh, Matt has been part of the NOAA team supporting the designation of the last three reserves that have joined the national system. He is actively involved in convening and collaborating with stakeholders holders to achieve coastal resilience and habitat restoration objectives at multiple geographic scales. He's a master's in environmental science and policy from John Hopkins University. Uh, Rob Tunin is a research professor in the School of Ocean and Earth Sciences and Technology at the U University of Hawaii at Manoa and is located at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology uh, in Kaneohe Bay on the Isle of Oahu. His research interests span a broad range of topics concerning the evolution and ecology of trophic marine biodiversity with the aim of applying his findings to conservation and management efforts. To date, he and his students have published over 200 peer-reviewed papers. Some current projects include coral reef biodiversity, population connectivity for fisheries management, alien invasive species biology and coral resilience under human impacts and future climate change. Together with Heia site partners, he has been involved with efforts to nominate and designate the Heia near uh, from the early stages of the process. And before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to these guys in just a second, but I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions. Um, after the presentation, we'll have a dedicated question and answer uh, portion. Um, but you can go ahead. You can go ahead and send those questions in throughout the webinar. You do that. There's a question panel in the user interface. You can type them in, and then I will relay them to Matt and Rob uh, after the presentation is over. If you have any quick clarifying questions, uh, we may be able to address those uh, during the webinar. Um, and again, I'd encourage you to send in questions whenever they occur to you. Uh, you don't need to wait till the end. Uh, and we will definitely have time for questions. Okay, Matt and Rob, I'll turn it over to you now. Well, uh, thank you, Sarah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Matt. Great. Uh, thanks, Rob, also for joining me. Uh, I know it's early in the morning in Hawaii, but uh, thank you again. So before we uh, go into some details about the designation of the Heia near as well as the site itself, I wanted to provide some context of what the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a network of currently 29 estuarine sites around the country used to study wetlands and educate the public about estuarine systems. Reserves are essentially lands and waters protected for long-term research, education, and stewardship. The lands are typically owned and managed by states and their partners using existing state protections, which I say that because NOAA essentially does not impose any additional land management regulations on these places. Uh, these reserves are locally relevant and nationally significant, which is one of the reasons why they became reserves in the first place. What a reserve is not, it's not direct federal management, day-to-day -day management of the site. It's not a sanctuary or reserve, or refuge, I'm sorry, and relies on existing uh, land management regulations and policies of the state or local area, and it does not ban any existing uses or activities in the area. The NEARS are a very unique state-federal partnership program established under the Coastal Zone Management Act. NOAA provides national coordination, technical assistance, and funding. And each reserve is managed on a daily basis by a lead state partner. 
that could be a university or a state agency, typically with input from site partners or local stakeholders in that area. Both partners, core partners, state and federal, are financially invested in a reserve through a mandated 70-30 cost share arrangement for annual operating budgets. And what do we do? So reserves conduct environmental monitoring and research at these estuary sites to address local issues, and they're essentially we try to call them living laboratories. They provide professional training to local decision makers to improve coastal management. They offer K through 12 and public education programming for students and adults. And they are stewards of the natural resources ensuring for long-term protection for the activities I previously stated. How do reserves accomplish this? Well, they have these activities are coordinated at the national level, but are implemented locally at each individual site. Being place-based, reserve staff engage local communities and engage and create strong partnerships. They are able to successfully integrate research, education, stewardship capabilities to achieve reserve management objectives. And so essentially the reserves kind of provide a model for a comprehensive and integrative approach to the management of these estuarine systems. So what ties it all together into a national system, you might be wondering. Well, we have several components. One is our system-wide monitoring program called SWAMP, where we monitor a range of water quality, weather, and biological parameters to detect short-term variations and long-term trends that can be used to address coastal management issues. We have a coastal training program, provides up-to-date scientific information and skills to allow for better informed decision-making by local and regional coastal decision-makers. K-12 education program to increase ocean literacy of students, teachers, and the general public. We have near specific sentinel sites where we look at integrated characterization of water levels and marsh elevations on a common vertical scale so we can look at habitat responses to long-term changes in water levels and inundation patterns. And we also have a competitive research funding program to support user-driven collaborative research, assessment, and transfer activities to address critical coastal management needs identified by the reserves. So that's just uh, an overview of the NEARS. For the HIA National Estuarine Research Reserve, there is a process to designate reserves in the national system. And I'm going to briefly describe that process because it's very detailed and it takes a very long time. So this slide just shows you the basic process. It's a lot of little steps in there, but the key parts I wanted to point out is we don't go to the state, and I mean, no, it doesn't go to the state and say we want to reserve. The, the governor of that state submits to know our letter of interest in having a reserve. So this is a state-driven uh, initiation process. And there's also a detailed site selection process that's led by the state that results in a nomination to NOAA. So upon approval, no approval of that nomination, several other steps have to happen. So the site has, or the state has to develop a management plan for the site. And from NOAA's side, we uh, follow NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, as this is a federal action, and we need to develop an environmental impact statement. Also, both NOAA and the state partner have a memorandum of understanding or agreement uh, on how the site is managed and operated in perpetuity. And equally important, especially for universities in this case, is the development of an MOA between the university and all the land-owning partners and key stakeholders of the area. Now, other reserves have this as well that are run by state agencies, but for university, it doesn't have a lot of ownership of the lands and waters in these systems. That is very key. And eventually, there's a designation findings and a record of decision by NOAA, and then you have a reserve. Um, so some historical perspective here. Hawaii did have a reserve at one point. The Waimata Valley Reserve was designated in 1978, but it was de-designated in 1993, and that was a mutual agreed de-designation by the state and NOAA at the time. And the main issues that led to that uh, de-designation was their related to access to the site. It's very remote. There were land use issues and limited funding resources at the time. 
So we, we want to make sure we learn from this process with this new uh, reserve. So after we received that letter of uh, interest by the governor, we agreed to move forward with the state and the state led a site selection process. And Governor Abercrombie started this by sending a letter of interest to NOAA in July 2012. It was quite a few years ago, but uh, the governor had identified the uh, Hawaii Office of Planning to be the managing entity for this process for the state. And then in 2013, the state used a public solicitation process to send out a call for proposals for a future reserve. So this is their process that's laid out in the slide. So multiple sites were considered initially by the state. The state received interest from these organizations and need for these sites. Um, through their process, they eventually received formal proposals from two sites that were checked off here, Hilo Bay and the Hii Estuary in Kaneohe Bay. So both of these sites uh, were reviewed as part of their process. And the state formed two committees to evaluate which one of these sites is something we want to nominate or attempt to nominate. So they had a site evaluation committee and look at evaluating both sites and, a, and then a site selection committee to review the recommendations from the other committee. As part of this process, uh, the state also solicited public input uh, from the communities around these sites and developed a specific site selection criteria that was based on, on NOAA's general template that looks at four major categories of criteria. One is environmental representativeness, which is basically a suite of what we call ecological, biological, physical, and chemical characteristics, the value of the site for research, monitoring, and resource protection, kind of going back to the reason why we have reserves, as well as suitability for the site for education interpretation. And then what are the acquisition and management considerations for such a site? Subsequently, um, the site evaluation committee found that both of these were good sites to uh, to be candidates to move forward. And then the site selection committee um, then selected he as sites based on the, the scoring that was provided by the evaluation committee. And then, then the, nom the governor forwarded that nomination to NOAA in August 2013. So the site developed this nomination package that um, you can find online. But uh, as part of that nomination, the state also held public meetings in 2014 to solicit community feedback and gauge what, the, what kind of support there was for uh, the site nomination. And two public meetings were held in the vicinity of the preferred site in 2014, and all the interested parties surrounding landowners and the public in the area were invited. And uh, the result was in May 2014, that nomination was submitted to NOAA with that public input. So NOAA accepted the nomination, and the next phase of designation began. It's a very long process, as I pointed out. But um, there were two concurrent processes that occurred next. One was led by the state. They had to develop the management plan. And the other one was led by NOAA, and they resulted in an environmental impact statement. And then there was a lot of additional public engagement that went along with this process. And then both the NOAA and uh, the state supported each other as they went along developing these documents at the time. The result of this, uh, five, a five-year management plan for the site with, with a complete environmental impact statement was completed and the designation identified a preferred alternative which is a little different than what was nominated uh, as the site boundaries and it became the 29th reserve in January 19, 2017 of this year and it was actually the last official action by our 
previous NOAA administrator. So enough of that process piece, let's go into what we, this new site we have. So looking uh, at using a Google, Google Earth viewer, um, you'll see that we're looking at the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And the Hia Reserve is generally located at the, uh, where that arrow was pointing to, in Kaneohe Bay on the northeast side of the island of Oahu. So let's take a look at this site in a little more detail. So these are actually the, the preferred alternative, which became the official site boundaries. And it's uh, 1,385 acres in total of lands and waters. And the boundary um, has a lot of unique habitats and features in it. So in the marine portion, which is highlighted in a light blue on your slide, it's over 800 acres of primarily patch and fringing coral reefs and sand flats. And some of the most pristine reefs in the Kaneohe Bay are located around the island um, in the right corner right lower corner of the slide. And that island itself is um, home to uh, the Hawaiian Serene Biology, 28 acres, includes a research lab, and is home to the Rob and the managing partners. And it is actually surrounded by a refuge, a marine refuge, that has the most uh, protected reefs in the bay. And some unique characteristics that I guess would be very unique to in our system, um, but not necessarily for Hawaii itself. We have a fish pond that's over 80 acres, and it's very historically and culturally significant to Native Hawaiians. The pond dates back to at least 1400 uh, AD and is on the National Register of Historic Places. And, you know, the pond ex wall extends out in the water about 7,000 feet, linear feet. And it was at the time when it was active, and uh, they're trying to restore that at this point, you know, it was commonly used to, to culture and harvest uh, mullet and milkfish and some other species on shore as well. And the rest of the part of the reserve is, is upland area, and it consists of estuarine and freshwater wetlands and forested uplands, and uh, the 19 acres of that is going to be uh, the Hia State Park. And it's a mix of public and private lands, and it's a lot of um, area where they're demonstrating uh, loey or taro fields, um, which were very prevalent in the area, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and the Hagia stream flows through the middle of, um, of those upland areas. Currently, um, the fish pond, by the way, is being uh, is owned by Kamehameha Schools and is being restored by Papa Ha'ohia, which is a local nonprofit group, and I'm going to go into some of the other groups as well in my next slide. So this is like the land ownership mosaic that is very unique to the site, which is a challenge definitely for uh, the managing partner, but uh, I feel full confidence that they'll navigate this very well. Um, this is one of the main reasons why we have one of those multi-party MOUs between the site partner and all these other landowning entities. So I mentioned already the fish pond is owned by Kamehameha School, but is currently operated by another nonprofit. The upland part here is owned by the Hawaii Community Development Authority, but is also leased to uh, another community-based nonprofit, Kako Ivi is trying to restore the ecological and agricultural productivity of the wetlands of the area. And that's where we get the taro fields I mentioned. So here's an oblique view of that uh, the fish pond and the upland areas. As you notice, the fish pond has got a few breaks in it. Those have since been uh, closed, and it's a completely enclosed fish pond now. But why this site? Why Haia? Well, several reasons were, were uh, important in the designation. One was we did not have representation in our system for this, the Pacific Islands, specifically the, the insular biogeographic region 
as we kind of define the, the regions around the country. And given the extent of the, the alterations that this system is currently uh, dealing with, as well as invasives, there's tremendous opportunity for restoration of, of estuarine habitats and systems. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Plus, there's this whole traditional Hawaii ecological and cultural practices piece that uh, is really unique for our system. And so it, they're, they're, that's one of the main, another main reason why we, we, we find this to be a great asset to our national system. And it's going to provide a, an opportunity to, to explore a very unique research question that we'll talk about in a minute. Also, there's some other benefits to note. Um, Kaneohe Bay is the largest embayment in the state of Hawaii. It's the only site in the United States with the combination of fringing reefs, patch reefs, and true barrier reef. It was identified by the state as a sustainability hotspot. There's a NOAA Sentinel site located there. HIMB is there. Their research facilities are there. And it's one of the most studied coral reef ecosystems on the planet. So all great other benefits for having a reserve there. Now, I'm actually going to probably ask if Rob wants to say a word or two about this. But um, given the scale of the restoration manipulation that's ongoing at the site, the research question became a very uh, important factor uh, for the site as an estuarine research reserve. And we're looking at two fundamentally, two fundamental management strategies for this site. One is looking at contemporary ecological restoration, and the other is this traditional native Hawaiian land management practices. And how is the reserve going to address this research question? Well, the reserves are structured in a way that we'll use an integrated approach. So the reserve is going to evaluate these two different management strategies uh, that I think will make the, the reserve a model for ecosystem-based management in the Pacific Island ecosystems. And so some context to this. This is what the land portion of Ahia did look like less than 100 years ago. Uh, many, much of what you see is taro. And here's kind of then and now. So the historical photo uh, on the left and the current photo on the right, the star indicates where the fish pond is. But um, you'll notice historically there was a large functioning fish pond and taro fields with minimal development in the area. Now you have the whole eastern side of the site is mostly uh, suburban or urban development. And the wetlands have kind of been overtaken by invasives, and the fish pond was a, a, at a point of disrepair. So looking at these two strategies, both the traditional and the contemporary. So traditional native practices, some of the things that are going to be happening at the reserve are they're going to be looking at the restoration and redevelopment of these traditional agricultural and aquacultural practices. So the the light green is where the the taro fields will be restored. The fish pond is self-explanatory in the light blue. There are historical agricultural roads to support those uh, taro fields. And then there's a host of smaller activities in there that are either, either culturally related or related to the management of the, uh, the agricultural practices. And kind of this is what they're hoping, something that looks like this, where you'll have these um, low-E restoration or tower restoration provides kind of an experimental opportunity for the reserve to explore land use impacts uh, to the estuarine and coral reef environments. And so the site partner here, Kakoivi, you know, has even observed that endangered the endangered Hawaiian still is now using these restored areas as habitat. Looking at uh, restoring um, uh, 
native eco ecological habitats. Uh, there's several opportunities for the reserve, and then we'll do a compare and contrast, hopefully, as they move forward. But uh, the light yellow is their hope to restore some native uh, forest species in there. The light green is going to be uh, estuarine habitat res is restored, so they're basically replacing invasive mangroves with more um, native uh, grass species, wetland grass species. The darker blue areas are this restoration of the Hayes stream and the hydrology of that stream and a riparian uh, buffer around it. And then also in the light blue areas, you'll see that's where they're, they're actually these are some of these are ongoing, this coral reef restoration. They have an, al an invasive algae problem on these reefs and they're um, trying to remove these, this algae problem by a mechanical method and adding a native species. So they're mechanically removing invasive algae using this big sucker machine called the super sucker. And then they're also, you know, to control these, the, these, the algae remaining in these areas are help planting native sea urchin species. And I'm going to actually hand it off to Rob Tunin now from the University of Hawaii to talk about how all these partnerships will make these things work and maybe to explain a little bit more about this research question that uh, the reserve is going to tackle. So, Rob? Great. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, I don't have control of the slide, so hopefully you can advance for me as we go. Um, so do we have the next slide? Yeah. All right. So as Matt said, the um, this area is really an interesting um, – I think we can go on to the next one then, Matt. Thanks. So the area that we're looking here from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology back up to the mountain, looking at the nears from the ocean side, basically the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is sitting at the receding end of all of the waters coming down from the Heia watershed. And so we have the Heia stream flowing through uh, the area of Kakoi Ivi with the, the, the restoration of the taro patches that we're looking at those uh, maintaining sediment control, sediment retention in the uplands, nutrient removal of those fresh waters, which then go down uh, through the uh, fish pond out onto the coral reef environment. And we have a research lab that has been in location since 1947, basically studying, um, as Matt said, one of the most uh, protected and highest coral cover areas of, of Kaneohe Bay that has a long-term time series of, of sort of looking at the conditions of the bay. And so as the site partner, uh, hey, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology will be leading this research question, asking what uh, do we gain from these different management approaches? And on to the next slide, please, Matt. We have a number of site partners who have been involved in this effort from the outset. And in fact, um, in particular, Paipai Oheia and Kakoo Iidi were the uh, foundational groups, along with Ko'olau Poko Hawaiian Civic Club, to try to propose this site actually as the NEARS. And they asked the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to join in and to partner with them. And so this NEARS is, is particularly unusual in that the community uh, approached the state partners. This is a, a very much a community-driven effort from the very outset with these groups that have been trying to uh, remove alien invasive species and restore the ecological function of this highly impacted area and, and this, this uh, uh, fundamentally changed uh, estuary back to the traditional function. Um, and then Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology became involved with the formal designation process and, and studying and proposing the research question of how do we 
evaluate and, and what ecosystem services are provided if we compare these different strategies for how we may manage an area, a tropical estuarine research, uh, a tropical estuarine system such as this, in that we want to have um, a functioning ecosystem, we want to see it restored, but we also have to realize that we now have a city sitting you know, beside it, this, this urban area right beside it. And what are the services that this ecosystem provides to the people there? And so if we look at the community, what we find is that we have an incredible knowledge base um, from traditional people who have lived in this area. As Matt said, the fish pond um, was completed at least 600 years ago, and, and people will argue probably closer to 800 years of long-term persistent management with a community that was estimated to be of the same population as we see today in uh, a suburban and, and urbanized area that was distributed over this zone and was harvesting and, and maintaining an entirely sustainable population in this area for at least 800 years prior to Western contact. And so they have a long history of successfully managing this uh, estuarine research this estuarine resource and the question is um, which is a better strategy can we actually look at what people manage to accomplish under the traditional native hawaiian ahukua system and can we learn from those successes and on to the next slide please matt we have here in hawaii and, and particular in Haia. Um, this great resource of the kupuna, so the, these families who have, have this intergenerational knowledge of how things were harvested, what are the traditional practices, and what management was employed to successfully allow a population equivalent to today's without any imports of food, without any uh, Safeway or, or McDonald's, to live sustainably off the land and to have as far as, as we can construct with um, some of the historical ecology approaches, a very minimal effect on those natural resources that we have seen in the last 200 years with urbanization and um, basically uh, traditional or, or contemporary Western uh, resource management practices change pretty dramatically. And so these uh, community groups would like to try something different. And this site gives us the ability to directly compare these two different management strategies and ask what is the best strategy for this place and what lessons can we learn on the island of Oahu that we can export to other locations throughout the state. And that onto the next slide, I think that is the end of the prepared section and I think we can move into questions unless there was anything that you wanted to add Matt? No Rob I think you uh, you did a great job um, yeah I think there's uh, there's tremendous potential for this site and it provides definite and, and, and added um, and needed component to our national system um, all the reserves are different and all have their own unique characteristics. And this one will just add to the sum of the, uh, the knowledge that we gain over the years for our national system and for the folks who live on the coast around the country. OK. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt and Rob. Um, and if we're ready to move to questions, we have a couple now. And I just wanted to um, ask everyone on, if you, if you want to send in questions, go ahead and type the questions into the question panel of the user interface and send them in and I can relay them to Matt and Rob. Um, so starting with what we've got, um, do any other NIRs in the system use indigenous stewardship practices? What other NIRs engage in significant collaboration with in indigenous stakeholders? Uh, I guess I'll take that, Rob. Uh, I, could, I can name two, or actually three right off the bat. Um, 
One is our, our reserve we just designated in 2010, uh, the Lake Superior Reserve. And they work with uh, local tribes and tribal organizations up in uh, Lake Superior in Wisconsin and um, Minnesota-related tribes up there. So that's one. Uh, the other two are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I would definitely say Padilla Bay and uh, Kachemak Bay as well. Uh, Padilla Bay is in Washington State. Kachemak is in um, Alaska. And one other one uh, would probably be down in uh, Ace Basin uh, and Sap, well, two, Ace Basin, Sapwell Island, both in uh, South Carolina and Georgia, and they deal with the, uh, some native um, African-American uh, Creole populations down there. So there's, there's, there's at least three or four that have direct engagement with uh, Native communities, uh, and there's probably some more in the system that do. The, I'm just not as familiar with what's going on with those sites. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, another question that came in, um, who initiated slash led the NEPA process and was HEPA triggered? And if you could uh, specify NEPA as National Environmental Policy Act, I believe, and the HEPA I'm not actually sure about. Well, Hawaii that's probably the, Hawaii equivalent for Hawaii. Yes, that's the Hawaii equivalent, and uh, the well, NOAA led the national process, the Office for Coastal Management, uh, in coordination with the Hawaii Office of Planning, helped out a lot with that process as well as HIMB, and then uh, HEPA. Um, the state of Hawaii wanted to use is basically using our um, EIS that we developed in, with support of them to cover their HEPA uh, uh, requirements for the, basically the local state NEPA uh, requirements. OK. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, let's see. Can you go back to the slide with a historical tarot versus today's land use photo comparison? With historical agriculture in the area, is anyone looking at pesticide concentration in the sediments that might be released once the mangroves are removed? I'm going to actually let um, Rob answer that. He might have a better idea than I would. Um, if we can't answer it, we, we can direct you direct the questioner to one who, who probably could. That's more familiar with the site. So this is something that is just being started. So the, the first attempts to remove mangroves are just about to, uh, well, sorry, the PIPI, the, the orga fish pond organization, has been removing mangroves from the fish pond wall for uh, 15 years already and has made it about halfway around the fish pond. Um, the first efforts to remove mangroves from the estuarine portion of Heia Stream and, and to try to start to, to restore that uh, to native species is just about to start underway. And part of that uh, effort involves monitoring that the Department of Land and Natural Resources uh, is involved in um, Looking at sediment release, uh, water quality, there is a whole series of research questions that are sort of uh, based around that. I don't know uh, specifically of pesticide treatment uh, or, or monitoring for that, but there's a whole series of, uh, of tests that are involved with that uh, run by a group of researchers out of SOAS, and I'll have to check with them and find out if if, if pesticides are one of the things that they are planning on testing for. Okay. Um, great. Thank you very much. Okay. And let's see, another question. Where can locals or visitors go right now within or around the reserve boundary to learn more about it at the site level? Well, I, this is... Matt, I would just say the, the public access piece is the ES State Park. Folks can go there and observe, you know, look out onto the 
the water portion of the reserve and look back and see some of the land portions. Uh, otherwise, they would have to really arrange with the site partners individually to access certain parts of the reserve. I will say that Kako Ivi and Papo Hia, they have plenty of public uh, events where they uh, have work days out on their on the properties they lease and manage um, to do these practices that we've been talking about. And uh, I'm not sure about HIMB, but I'm sure there's a way that HIMB gets folks out there to see the uh, the campus on Coconut Island. But Rob, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, the HIMB runs community tours that anyone can go to the website and sign up. Um, they usually fill up months in advance because they're quite popular. And so, um, but you know, you have to sign up in advance, but people can do that. The community work days with both Paipai Oheia and Kakoi Ivi um, are regular community work days that have been going on now for a decade. And, and that again, anyone who's interested in the site uh, can sign up for these. They have the signups on their, their web pages. And this is something that will be integrated with the site, uh, trying to coordinate between all of the site partners as we move forward from this point. Okay, um, let's see. This reserve is close to the large Marine Corps base on the bay. How has or will the DOD, the Department of Defense, be engaged in supporting the objectives of the site? Well, I would just say from the perspective of when we did the uh, NEPA analysis, the uh, Marine Corps base, was, was kept informed of the process and um, was given the opportunity to comment and participate and they decided that this was, was okay. They didn't have any particular comments to worry about. Um, you know, Rob might have some other information that he could add to that. Yeah, I would say that the representatives of um, DOD have been present throughout all of the public scoping meetings and they've been kept informed sort of as things went forward. The end of the site is essentially the uh, marine reserve area around the uh, Moku Oloi, the, the uh, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology Island there, Coconut Island in the bay. And so it is actually quite a distance from BOD and they have um, basically said, well, it, it's not in fringing on us and, and it's not impacting us. You guys do what you want. Okay. Um, let's see. Were there any uh, difficulties or obstacles during the selection process, specifically in applying the criteria? If so, what was done to overcome them? Sarah, can you repeat that question real, real quick for me? Uh, were, were there any difficulties that were in, encountered in the selection process, and if so, what was done to overcome them? The selection of the, of the yes. site itself. Yes. Um, yeah, you, your total well, list. Yep. So that, some of that you'd have to really approach the, uh, the state for. They ran that process. Uh, I guess they, you know, if, if, I had to, if I had to, you know, speak to that, they would, it would be that, you know, they could, they probably, um, you know, we would have liked to have seen more uh, sites submit proposals um, during their course of their public solicitation process, but, you know, it's a state process. We don't control that at NOAA. Um, they had their public process and um, they got two strong candidates and, you know, I personally like both, but, uh, but they made a selection and, um, you know, that's what uh, NOAA moves forward with when we accept the nomination. And, uh, but, you know, he is a great site and so is the other one. I mean, we could have two reserves in Hawaii, but um, my boss would probably kill me for saying that. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, this is, you know, we, we were, the, the state nominated the site in Kaneohe Bay and that's what we move forward with. So I didn't see any problems with that, and uh, if that answers the question. If not, uh, let me know. 
Okay, and the next question, uh, sort of related, but then just actually about the designation of, of the NIR. So what opposition or controversy, if any, was there to establishing the reserve, and let's say after uh, uh, the, the HEIA was selected, uh, and how was it addressed? But at the state level? Uh, the I think at any level would be appropriate to respond, yeah. So there's uh, the if there was definitely I, I remember questions you know other sites other folks wanted their you know their sites to be um, to be chosen um, but there was a you know a specific criteria there was scoring all those are put, all that's public avail available through a Hawaii Office of Planning and this is just how you know. Two sites scored very closely, and uh, this is how they they you know they came out. Hey, it came out slightly with a better score when we look at the suite of criteria that I mentioned before, when it, regarding you know availability or suitability for research, monitoring, education, and interpretation, uh, and representativeness of the you know the the ecology, the um, hydrology, et cetera, of the area, they can, they scored very similarly. I mean, the, the state could have probably gone with one or the other. My guess is there's, you know, there's a lot of considerations that go into the site uh, selection process at the state level, uh, but, you know, NOAA's um, kind of not part of that process. Uh, we really, this is why it's it's a very unique state-federal partnership where NOAA doesn't, or the federal government doesn't impose on the state. The state makes that choice of what they want to do, and we provide guidance to that process. But uh, they, you know, they submit that, and you know, other states and other sites have, you know, the same way with, um, with the, all the sites I worked on. What was unique about um, all processes for designation is that, you know, the state has very clear ideas when they go in. There's always champions for these processes of, of looking at sites, but that's why we go through a site selection process to kind of really identify what site is most appropriate to meet the needs of the national system and to be part of our, our, our national system. So we can go that, through site. Oh, sorry, ahead. Matt. And I think the the second question was just getting out like, uh, just was there any opposition to creating a near in Hawaii in general? Not necessarily that the selection. Um, of, yeah. No, I mean there was a there was a reserve in Hawaii historically, and there was no opposition to creating a near. There's probably some uh, there's definitely some questions from certain uh, constituencies within the islands about what does this mean. Uh, is the is the NOAA coming in and creating something that is going to be run by the federal government? Uh, there's those concerns that happen every place we go, essentially. But that um, as as they learn about what we're actually doing, uh, any of those kind of questions kind of uh, dissipate and go away, because really it's you know we don't you know, manage the sites directly. They're run by the states using existing state regulations. The existing uses can happen. These are not, uh, it says reserve in its name, but it's not a, a sanctuary or protected space where nobody can do anything. These are a lot of existing uh, activities happen in these reserves. Um, the fishing community, as soon as they found out that they were still going to be able to fish, um, that made them feel very comfortable that we weren't in Poe coming in and saying you can't fish or, or anything like that in that area. And that's kind of how the system is run. It's, it's a research and education um, program primarily where we look at these sites versus trying to impose a, a set of rules and regulations on the site that might happen with other uh, federal programs. So we're very unique in the, in the, in the respect that we uh, rely a lot on what the state already has in place, what the relationships are, et cetera. Okay. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, 
we have several more questions. Um, one, how are the research questions that a site will address uh, proposed and selected? Rob, you want to handle that? So basically, the the initial uh, efforts came out of a number of community meetings. So uh, folks in Kaneohe were invited. All of the site partners were asked to participate and to hold public scoping meetings about what are the primary research questions that the community wants addressed. And then that was uh, through some uh, give and take with, with Noah about the national program, trying to figure out exactly how we can mesh the questions that the community is interested and most interested in um, with the larger vision of the system about what questions can HAIA contribute to the national system. Um, and that, that's basically where these research questions have come out of for the first uh, round of the management plan, and obviously those will be refined, uh, expanded on in, in the course of the first five years of having a site. We'll then be trying to look at, at in sort of five-year increments with the, the management plan and moving forward, how do we refine and uh, uh, expand those research questions to better understand what is the best way to manage this site. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, can you do, provide more detail about the benefits and support that the nearest sites receive? I'll start that, Rob. Uh, from the from the support side, the um, again, uh, this is a program where both the, the NOAA and the state uh, provide resources to support a reserve, and um, it's a cost share program. So you know the the NOAA funding provides uh, support to help um, manage some of these national programs that are part of being at what a reserve is, like uh, SWAMP system-wide monitoring program. You know, there are monitoring equipment that goes along with that. There's um, a weather station. There's all kinds of capabilities that get built into that program and have to be managed um, annually because they're, they're, they're taking data at regular intervals uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so all that stuff has to be managed and maintained. So some of that support goes there. Uh, NOAA provides a lot of support uh, with some of the other staff that manage and operate some of the programs like coastal training or education or uh, stewardship staff. And it's, um, we also provide a lot of guidance at the national level on how to operate these programs and develop them. Uh, we also try to uh, bring everybody together periodically to in the system to share ideas and knowledge across the system. And I thought we find that very beneficial for the reserves. And I think that will especially be one benefit for the, for the reserve out here since it's the only reserve in Hawaii. And uh, getting to, to meet their peers and, and, and collaborate with them is going to be very important moving forward. Um, but then there's also a lot of support that comes from the state and the partners. It could be in the, in the form of staff positions. It could be in the form of um, volunteers, et cetera. There's just quite a few. I think it, it takes a while for these things to develop over time. They're just starting out. Um, Rob, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think one of the uh, primary benefits that we see from uh, um, the, the ground side and the, the community and all these partnerships is that people have been trying to restore this area and trying to work on uh, integration and, and basically each of the, the nonprofits have been working on restoring their area independently for over a decade and, and what this will provide is sort of the glue to hold all of those efforts together and to make it a, a mountain to uh, ocean integrated effort of restoration of an entire watershed that basically this is, is trying to create um, an ahupua, one of the traditional Native Hawaiian management units 
that follows fresh water from, from the mountain peaks to the ocean. Uh, and that is something that is going to take a coordinated effort. And, and each one of these groups has been doing a great job of doing that. But now we have the ability with this support to make it a single integrated effort that is beyond what people can do on their own. OK, great. Um, well, thank you, guys. This, um, we had a couple more questions that we weren't able to get to, but I'll be able to provide you with those questions um, uh, in a report later. But we really appreciate you coming on and speaking about the, the new NEAR. And, um, and actually, for anyone who would like to let colleagues know, we're going to be hosting another uh, webinar on this topic at a more uh, um, business office hour friendly uh, time for Hawaii uh, later in the month. So uh, just stay tuned for the NOAA MPA Center's newsletter um, for the information on, on that. The, um, well, thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you doing this. And uh, we look forward to having you on actually in the very near future to talk about this again uh, for uh, others in the, in the region as, as well as uh, other parts of the world. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. All right.